All right. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the expert interview series. Today I have with me a dear friend of mine and a business growth specialist, Dan Liu. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hey, Celine. Thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Absolutely. So I recently got your uh, book, uh, the business, the marketing and business growth playbook, and I found it very, very interesting. And so that's why I wanted to bring you here today. Um, and so before we get started and dive into the nitty gritty of growing a business, why don't you take a minute and just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background or whatever you want to share with um, the viewers. Sure. So my name is Dan Liu, uh, originally from the East Coast, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey area. And uh, a couple of years ago, um, decided to move out to Southern California, to San Diego. Um, and also during that transition, also went from a mechanical engineer working for the government to um, now a marketing person. So during that transition, I was doing a lot of different things in the marketing world, just really trying to figure out what I enjoyed doing and um, you know what I didn't enjoy doing. So in that process, a lot of learning um, from various you know marketing mentors and, and people from you know the current space as it is in terms of digital marketing and you know even going back to decades to really understand you know everything from uh, website design to copywriting to sales funnels um, and other various strategies as well. And so uh, that's been my journey over the last couple of years is really trying all those different things, doing the funnel side um, and the technical stuff, but realizing, you know, I personally like working with people and working in or more so on the strategy side of the business. Um, and so taking everything I learned in the last couple of years, um, I really wish that there was a book that was kind of like a step-by-step -step blueprint um, that allowed me to really get all the foundational pieces together for, you know, my business. And so, you know, I looked out in the space, you know, lots of great books out there. Um, but I felt like a lot of them were missing some things, you know, they really dove into uh, certain topics, but then I'd have to get another book that would help me with a different topic. And I also wanted to create something that was more of a, a playbook and mm -hmm. a, a make, make it more like a, a plan. And so that's kind of how I developed this uh, book and, you know, called it a, work, a playbook because I, I think it's, you know, the foundational piece that virtually every business, whether you're online or offline needs to really just build out the main uh, building blocks. So you have, you know, a all around foundational fundamental business strategy uh, right from the get go. Yeah. <clears throat> and that was the one thing that stood out to me the most when I was reading your book is how easy it is to implement those strategies. And you have a very um, thorough process there. Um, and so I'm excited to dive into this today. So um, hindsight overview from a strategy standpoint, let's start with what are the three ways that business owners need to focus on in order to grow their revenue? Yeah, so there's really three main ways to grow a business. So number one is uh, acquiring more clients or customers. Mm -hmm. The second way is to increase the average order value for every transaction that occurs in your business. And then mm -hmm. the third way is to increase the frequency of transactions um, for you know each client or customer that comes in. And so what happens is a lot of people kind of get fixated on getting more clients, but not looking into the other two strategies, which are actually easier because once you have the clients, you know, it's a little bit, um, like I said, easier to be able to offer them more products and services or to have them come back in. And so what happens is a lot of business owners will kind of focus on, you know, paid advertising or SEO and just trying to get more people in the door, essentially, and not really thinking about the strategy of, OK, how can I increase the average order value? How can I you know, get people to come back in or how can I get them to refer other people? And mm -hmm. it's something they kind of think about and they might implement here and there, but it's not something that's really consistent. And because of that, you know, I feel like a lot of small business owners, especially are really missing out on opportunities to really grow and scale uh, efficiently. Yep, absolutely. Those are the three, you summarize them perfectly. I like that. And um, I've kind of noticed 
similar issues in my um, industry and the people I work with. Um, most of the time, they are always after um, acquiring new clients and just cutting through everything and taking the shortest way possible to just get more clients, get more clients, get more clients. And then it gets to a point where they kind of like spin their wheels around to the point where if they don't get as many clients, let's say month one, they get 30 new clients. Month two, they get 10 new clients. They just stress out. They start thinking that that strategy doesn't work. And then they just kind of like look for the next shortcut. But like you said, um, having frequency of purchase, it's a great way to increase retention and get those same clients back in the door. And I think that, and maybe you can um, expand on this a little bit more, is how to get people to buy more or increase the transaction value has also a lot to do with understanding what your value ladder is in your business. And it's something that you talked about on the book a lot. Mm -hmm. So um, if you can take a minute and just give like a simple explanation to someone who's never heard of a value ladder, or maybe they've heard of it, but they just don't know how to implement it in their business. And we'll take, for example, a wellness, um, small wellness business. Um, How can they implement that value ladder um, in their business so that they could actually leverage that strategy of increasing the value transaction? Yeah. So a value ladder is essentially a suite of products or services Uh, and usually at various price points. And so the idea is that, you know, a person will typically uh, start at the bottom of the value ladder. So if you don't yet have a relationship, maybe they're trying out your business, um, they're likely going to want to maybe invest in something that's of lower price uh, before they really, you know, invest into higher priced uh, products or services of yours. So, you know, ideally they start at the bottom, you know, a low maybe priced or introductory offer, And then once they experience your products or services, they get value and benefit, then they'll move to the next level, which is maybe a uh, mid-priced offer and then, you know, higher priced and and so on and uh, so forth. And so for a wellness business, um, you know, you can have, let's say, an introductory offer uh, for first time clients to come in and be able to experience your products and services. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you can have, um, you know, maybe just a single session you can think about three uh, session packages, five session. You can think about bundling maybe other products and services as well. So, you know, there's a lot of freedom to it. Uh, a value ladder is very broad and it really differs between every industry and even between companies. Yeah. So it's really however you want to create it. And even, you know, the price points that you have for your business are all going to vary as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also, I want to make a note that it's not absolutely necessary. Certain people will come into businesses and, or a business may only have, you know, one or two core products and services that they offer and they just want to stick with that. But a value ladder is a way to potentially open the doors to more people to come into an introductory offer um, and then kind of work their way up from there. And so with the value ladder, you know, ideally you want to be able to obviously offer great products and services, but then making offers at the right time. So if somebody just came in, maybe they had their introductory offer, you know, that's the opportune time to offer them of something higher up on your value ladder, because in that moment, that's when they're really, you know, experiencing the value and the benefit. Um, And so you don't want to wait too long. And that also kind of brings me to my next point, is that you want to make sure that you have a follow up process, right? So not just for people who are looking to come into your business, maybe people that are leads, but also people that have already paid you for your products and services. You want to make sure that you have a long-term outlook and you want essentially a a client for life if it makes sense for your business. Because, you know, if you invested the time and energy and maybe even money to acquire them, and ideally you want to, you know, um, have them come back to your business as much as possible. So mm-hmm. following up with them, not just in terms of frequently enough, you know, a lot of businesses, I realize they rarely follow up. And if they do, it's often just to, you know, make a pitch and it's, you know, months in between, right? So sometimes it's like, I go to a business, I have a great experience and then I won't hear from them for months. Yeah. And so at between that time, I may be looking at other things or I may even need their products and services, but yeah. you know, like, everyone is these days, I'm distracted and I just don't remember. So you wanna make sure that you're top of mind 
as much as possible. So even if that's sending out at least one email just to touch base with all of your clients. Yeah. And if you do that, it'll be easier to uh, have people take your offers when you do make them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't have to pitch something every week, but as long as you're, you know, keeping in touch, uh, maybe even following up to see how their experience was. And if they say, yeah, I had a great experience. Then at that time, then you say, Hey, would you like to maybe come in for, or here's an offer for 10 sessions or whatever the case is. Yeah. Right. So you want to be very strategic and not just hope that just because somebody got a great experience or had a great experience that they're naturally just going to come back or they're naturally going to share your business. Mm -hmm. As I said before, everyone's busy and distracted and, you know, social media and everything. So you just want to make it very easy for your clients to remember who you are, that, you know, your business exists and to also, you know, come back, um, yeah. you know, and as frequently as it can, if it makes sense, of course, right. You don't want people to come in if it's not necessary, but again, a lot of times people do need to come in for products and services, but they just get distracted. So it's important for the business to understand that and to have processes in place to keep in touch with them at least once a week and to make offers um, and not just assume people are just going to come back uh, yeah. frequently. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, yeah, of course. But something that I've also noticed a lot is that there's no segmentation in from the business owner's perspective. They don't really segment their client uh, list. They don't really know which one came first. They just blast out random, not random, but like gener gen generic emails with yeah. random offers and they hope something will stick and somebody will book an appointment. Instead of, like you said, being strategic about bringing in someone for a lower introductory offer and then following up with them throughout that process because if they experience your service, they loved it, then they have more chance, it's more likely that they're gonna take you up on the next offer instead right. of just go ghosting them for a month, like you said, and, and, and just asking something from them, right? Yeah. You wanna build that relationship through the follow-up process, like you said, and then slowly work them up. Um, so those are amazing tips and uh, strategies, recommendations. I appreciate that, thank you so much. Now, I wanna dive into um, the first chapter of the book, um, you talk about the marketing fundamentals, right? Mm -hmm. And in, in, in that chapter, you talk about the concept of a customer versus a client. And that's something that resonated with me a lot because I always encourage my clients to refer to their um, people, people that do business with them as their client versus customers. But I want to hear your take on it and um, just talk a little bit about that concept of a customer versus a client you know, a commodity versus how you stand out in the marketplace. And um, if you can expand on that. Yeah, for sure. So it's a concept that, um, you know, I really took from Jay Abraham, who's a world renowned, you know, business strategist. And um, so a customer is, according to Webster's Dictionary, someone uh, who purchases a, purchases a commodity, mm -hmm. while a client is somebody who is under the protection of another. And so, you know, it may seem like a very subtle difference, but it's a really different in terms of how you approach not just your business um, and the people that are buying from you, but also the people that work for you as well, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure that you are approaching every situation with the other person's best interest um, at heart and as a priority. And I think when you do that, you start to really try to look out for them and make sure they're, they're you know, making the right decisions for them. Um, you're not just seeing them as, you know, numbers on a spreadsheet, you know, mm -hmm. each week or each month, which is very transactional. Mm -hmm. And I think overall, it's just a, a better mentality for building a business because now you're really trying to add more value to people where you can, you're trying to make sure that they get the results that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whatever your product or service is supposed to do that, um, you know, you're really trying, cause not everybody gets results from, you know, what they're purchasing products and services for. And a lot of times it's it's not the fault of the business. It's just, you know, human nature gets in the way. People forget to do something they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we often start stuff, but don't finish it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you have that mindset of protecting somebody else and looking at them as a client, you really want to make sure you do everything in your power to make it as easy as possible for them to get the results you want. Because, mm -hmm. you know, as a byproduct, 
the more people that you help get results, the more likely they're going to tell other people and it's just going to come back, you know, to you versus, you know, just seeing as somebody come into your business, you know, here's a transaction, a dollar amount, and then, okay, now it's on to the next person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, yeah, that was a major shift uh, as well. And just trying to make sure that, you know, when you operate your business day to day, that when you're putting out content or you're talking on the phone, that you're really trying to keep that person in their interests uh, as a priority. And, you know, sometimes you have to make sacrifices. Sometimes you got to bite the bullet here and there uh, mm -hmm. for your own business. But again, I think it'll come back um, in a much more positive way if you just operate from that space uh, each and every day. Yep. And then, um, yeah, that's, that's really powerful because once you make that mindset shift, like even the um, message you put out, the people you're going to attract are going to be the type that want to invest they're going to be the type that are not afraid of spending money because they don't want just a commodity they don't want something that it can exchange versus the dollar amount they're spending they want a transformation they want someone to help them to you know solve the problem that they're actually trying to solve so right. there will be better clients there will be high quality clients and so it's all about making that mindset shift and then starting to act um, according to that so absolutely uh, that concept is really powerful and a lot of businesses, some of them have grasped that, but I can still see a lot of people that are just kind of like, it's my business, you come in, you buy, you leave, and I'm just here running the business. But right. uh, that mindset shift is really powerful. Um, sure. The second thing you talked about in uh, marketing fundamentals is what you market versus how you market it. And I, I thought that re that's really powerful because it's, you know, no one wants the drill. What they want is the hope. Right. So right. It's about what equipment do you have or how, you know, the features of whatever thing that you're using, but like, how does that help your ideal client? And right. I, I'm sure that's kind of like the idea that you were referring to here, but I would love to hear your thoughts on um, how can someone market better and not just the what, but the how. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you look around at most products and services, it's, um, you know, there's a lot out there to choose from, right? So it's really important to find ways to get your message across clearly um, and, you know, differentiate yourself, right? So, you know, there's a lot of people that sell very similar products and services. And so if you really want to stand out, you have to think about how can you, uh, you know, get your message to resonate with your ideal client? How can you talk to you know, the pains that they're trying to address or the desires that they're trying to uh, achieve or, or goals or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, it's not as easy as just to say like, hey, I have this, it's for sale, right? Right. You might get the attention of some people, but it's much more effective if you understand, you know, why they would even want to buy that in the first place um, so that you can really speak to it and get them to understand that you understand as a business um, and you're empathetic about it and that you have the solution to whatever, maybe their problem or their obstacle that they're trying to address. Um, another thing I was, you know, thinking about when I wrote that is also, you know, if you think about the uh, transactional side too, as well. So, you know, how you market things again, like if you look at the concept of sales funnels that I talk about in the book, the timing of when you make offers um, is very important as well. So, you know, if you were trying to increase the average transaction size um, for your business, then how do you basically add an upsell or a downsell to your process mm -hmm. rather than waiting till later, right? So, you know, you can offer the same thing, but the timing of when you offer those things matters. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, these little things that really make a big difference if you extrapolate, uh, you know, if you have a, a fairly successful business and you're thinking about you know, days, weeks, months, and years, you know, small tweaks here and there of, you know, what you're offering, when you're offering, and then how you're offering it, what you say uh, makes a difference, right? So like the concept of sales funnel, something that, you know, you and I are pretty familiar with, um, but most people aren't, makes a huge impact on the average order value. So like even large companies uh, who have, let's say, e-commerce stores, I believe are missing out on a lot of opportunity because they are offering, let's say upsells or similar products here and there. But if you look at the best marketers in the world and how they use upsells, it's totally different. And it's so much more effective. 
Um, and so again, it goes back to, you know, it's not just what you're marketing, it's just a product or a service, but it's, you know, how you insert it, how you talk about it, how you present the offer that really, you know, makes a huge impact on your results. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the idea of knowing who your clients are inside out, like better than they know themselves, that is going to be very powerful for people to kind of like understand how to market versus what to market. Because a lot of times you get stuck into like marketing the thing instead of marketing the solution that it provides for the, you know, target market. Right. And so, um, yeah, knowing your client is really important. And um, which brings us to the third point of the marketing fundamentals, which is the USP. It's a lot of people are familiar with the unique selling proposition. It's an old term. A lot of big companies use it, you know, but I don't see its application a lot in the small business world. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to get your insights on how can someone craft a unique selling proposition so that they can stand out from the marketplace because most of the time local businesses, they're not the only one offering that service in the area. Sometimes you get lucky, you're pretty much the only one within a certain radius, but there are also other indirect competitors. And so from a consumer be a standpoint, they always have choices. So how would you um, advise a business owner to craft their unique selling proposition? Yeah. So, I mean, there's lots of ways you can go about it because there's different areas um, that you can look into. Uh, so if you're selling, you know, a, a product or service that a lot of other people um, offer as well, it, it makes it, of course, a little bit difficult, right? But a small kind of distinction can really make a big impact. Um, so, you know, a, a USP can be anything from, you know, a certain location that you're in that makes it, let's say, much more convenient than everyone else. It could be, um, you know, maybe how you have your environment set up or the shopping experience for the person. How do you make it easier or less stressful for people? Mm -hmm. um, a USP can even be how you create your products and services, right? So, you know, is there a unique way that you, you know, created or came up even with the idea that even makes you a little bit different than somebody else that would be attractive? Um, to your target market, right? So the story that is attached to your business, so not even necessarily the product or service, it could be the same as everyone else, but your story of why you created the product or service, you know, did you have a life event that, you know, was the catalyst for that mm -hmm. uh, could be your USP. Yeah. Um, you can talk about maybe a, a risk reversal or a guarantee that you offer that nobody else offers. So, you know, very basic example is somebody offers uh, a 14 day money back guarantee and yours is 60, that really lowers the barrier of entry for a lot more people and then brings a lot more people to your business. Now, that's something you would have to test and say, all right, if I lower that, how many people actually take me up on that guarantee? Am I gonna lose money? Now, ideally the, the amount of additional business you'll get from it is gonna far outweigh, you know, let's say the amount of returns, but, yep. um, you know, it's, it's really looking at various parts and, and just thinking, okay, what, what is everyone else doing and what can I do a little bit differently that just gives me that little bit of an extra edge that, um, that would of course be important to the target market, right? So you just don't want to come up with something that sounds good to you if it's not important to the person that's considering the competition and, and whether or not they're going to buy from you or somebody else. Yeah. Um, so it's trying to put yourself in their shoes as well and think, okay, what if I were a consumer? And you can always ask people as well, like, you know, have a survey, um, talk to your friends and family and just ask like, hey, if this were my USP, yep. you know, what would, is that valuable to you? And ideally, again, there'd be your, your target market. So, you know, they would have more valuable insight for you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and you know, anything, anything little. And then when it comes to using your USP, you wanna make sure that you are, telling people that, right? So on your website, make it very clear, maybe in the header, like what sets you apart that, you know, or what do you provide that others don't or cannot, yeah. right? Because that's really what's going to get people. And once you have a USP, it really becomes, you know, 
a huge advantage because again, it's much more difficult for somebody to compare you to someone else if you were just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. And again, if you're in a competitive space, that little extra edge can really make a big difference. So um, yeah, I think it's important to, to look around your space too, just kind of take note of, you know, what are other people trying to use as their USP if they have one? And, uh, you know, trying to draw some inspiration or ideas from that. And hopefully that can kickstart your own brainstorming process and help you develop your own USP. Awesome. I love it, man. Yeah. Location, shopping experience. My favorite is the story. I always um, like encourage my clients to put their stories up front. That's, you know, a great way to um, stand out from everyone else. And also just know your competition, right? Um, yeah. Competition and see how you can stand out. And then another thing you mentioned that's really valuable is ask the market. A lot of times as business owners, we always think that this will be good or that would be great. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we think. It's all right. about. So I love yeah, exactly. all those questions. Um, thank you for sharing that. Now, yeah, I'm going to move on to another uh, part. Um, I think it was towards the, um, I think chapter nine, somewhere along the book, you talk about strategic partnerships. So. Yeah. I was blown away by so many like strategies I've never heard about, which kind of like opened my mind to this whole world of strategic partnerships. And so I wanted to kind of like ask you to pretty much talk about this powerful yet underutilized um, way to grow a business. Um, and if you can share a couple steps or insights or strategies on yeah. how can someone benefit from strategic partnerships to grow their business? Sure. Yeah. So strategic partnerships is, you know, one of the, I don't want to say fastest, but it's one of the best ways to be able to tap into, um, you know, the target market that you're trying to reach. So every business, no matter what you sell, what your products and services are, as soon as you start a business, you're basically in this network of businesses or companies that are already servicing, um, people or, you know, your, your target market. Some overlap with other companies and businesses and, you know, some don't, but understand that the target market that you want to attract, those people are already buying similar complementary and non-competitive uh, products and services. So, you know, ideally you want to be able to build relationships with those other businesses and, you know, have a way for you to, you know, help their business and then, have them help your business, right? So rather than being the standalone business and uh, just trying to get clients or customers, you know, working with other people is one of the fastest ways to, again, tap into that market. Yeah. And one of the great things about it is, you know, if another company is, um, you know, investing in advertising and investing in marketing and they're growing their cu customer or client base and you have a great relationship with them, that means the more they build their business, the more referrals that they can send to you, right? Yeah. So as a byproduct of them doing their thing, you know, you get to benefit as well. And hopefully you kind of return the favor. So as your business grows, you can send them um, or send business their way as well. And ideally it's a, it's a mutually beneficial relationship and, you know, there's no limit to the amount of partners you can have. Right. Yeah. And so obviously the more, the better, that just means more ways for people to, uh, be referred to your business. And, you know, another benefit of that is rather than putting out advertising and trying to reach a cold market of people who have no idea who you are, when you have a partner that refers somebody to you, you know, there's already some level of trust and credibility there, right? Mm -hmm. So you can kind of shorten the sales cycle a little bit and uh, kind of leverage the relationship that that business or company has with their customers or clients. You know, just like if, you know, you and I were talking and I recommended a business to you, you know, you would be much more inclined to check them out and uh, trust them versus you going out looking, you know, through ads or wherever to find a company on your own. Um, and then when it comes to finding strategic partners, again, this is something I learned from uh, Jay Abraham. Uh, you know, the process would be to think about your products and services and then think about what are your, what is your target market buying um, before, during, after, and then even instead of your products and services. And that way you kind of get the whole timeline mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, what people are purchasing in what industries or what professions. 
And then from there, once you get the industries or professions down, then you can kind of narrow down specific businesses or companies that you would want to work with. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of companies or business owners that will go out and they'll network and they'll go to these events and they don't have a strategic kind of approach to partnering with people. It's more of, oh, what do you do? And they kind of think about, oh, can I, you know, how can we work together versus mm -hmm. intentionally thinking about, okay, these are the people that would make great partners. They already have my clients um, and, you know, I'm going to look out for these people or I may even reach out to these people and be more proactive about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes to strategic partnerships, I mean, it's really, there's lots of ways you can go about it. You, you can, you know, send referral fees or commissions, or it can just be kind of a, a word of mouth type of thing. You know, there's really no set in stone type of thing that you have to do. Um, it's really up to kind of your business. And of course, there's things you have to keep in mind with that in terms of guidelines and regulations. Um, but you know, it's really just trying to come up with ways to, to help each other. So that's a win-win for everybody, right? You know, you win for yourself, win for your partners, and then win for the end clients as well. So you can maybe do deals where, hey, if you purchase something from me, my partner will give you a discount, right? Yeah. So the, the client will benefit, uh, you know, they, your, your partner gets a new client, and then you get maybe a new client because that's the, the offer that you made, or yeah. vice versa. You know, if they want to send somebody your way, Hey, if you buy from them, I'll give you 10% off or yep. something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Or I'll send the partner 10% of that first transaction. So, mm -hmm. you know, instead of paying for advertising, I'm going to pay my partner instead mm -hmm. and I'm going to get a new client. They they're going to get business and the client may get a discount or something as well. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it's understanding the that process and trying to craft, you know, ways to, to, for everyone to win. Right. That's the goal here. Yeah. Um, so basically identifying the, throughout the customer, like the buying journey, whether they buy before, during, after, or instead of, and then finding those businesses and basically just structuring a deal where everyone wins, yeah. whether that's referring plus a discount, whether that's, you know, a commission type deal where you pay them for everybody that gets sent to you and vice versa. I mean, you just got to get creative and see what works for that um, specific relationship. Um, yeah. And again, I mean, if you compare that to, let's say like advertising, right? Advertising is something you kind of have to constantly put money in and, and work from, but when you, and I'm not saying you shouldn't advertise, it's just a matter of, you know, doing all these different things. Right. Uh, and by having those partners, again, if they're doing things on their own, they're investing the dollars, their time, their expertise, and their energy into growing their business, and you have a great relationship with them. I mean, that's just something that's working that you're leveraging, right? So one of the things I talk about a lot in the book is, you know, ways of using leverage to, uh, to improve or grow your business and strategic partners is, you know, one of the best ways to do that. Cause again, they're, you're leveraging their efforts in a way that's going to benefit not only yourself, but them as well. So, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's great. And actually that was my next point here, because in the book, you talk a lot about the leverage framework. Um, yeah. I know it's kind of like a, um, I would say sort of advanced concept because it has a lot of, um, it's an acronym that stands for um, many words. So if you wanna just give us um, a quick kind of like crash course into that leverage framework and how can somebody leverage it to yeah. grow their business. Yeah, so, you know, we hear a lot about the concept of, you know, work smarter, not harder, right? And the the concept of leverage, but there really hasn't been a, a simple kind of framework or process for how can people actually use or implement or think about leverage uh, in their in their business. So, you know, I came up with this acronym. So each letter of the word leverage basically stands for a, uh, a category. Mm -hmm. And so within each category, there are different things to look into. So, you know, the first step would be to think about whatever your goals are. Um, you know, understand that and then understand what obstacles or chat or actually, excuse me. So let's backtrack. Think about what your goals are. Then think about what you need to achieve those goals, right? Mm -hmm. What has to happen uh, for that, for you to hit those targets. Mm -hmm. Then think about any obstacles or challenges that you may have, right? Whether it's limited uh, capital, um, you know, uh, you don't have enough personnel, maybe it's time, Knowledge, whatever the case may be. Expertise, whatever. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. So once you kind of have that thought about, then you go through each of the letters. So L, 
So hopefully I can remember all these. It's a lot of letters. Lessons. Uh, L stands for lessons. Basically, that's trying to learn from your peers, um, learn their successes, their mistakes or their failures. Mm -hmm. um, anything you can that can basically kind of prevent you from going down maybe the wrong path or help you shortcut uh, mm -hmm. anything. So somebody you know already went through the process, how mm -hmm. can I learn from them so I don't have to make the same mistakes that are going to cost me time, energy, or money? Okay. Um, e would stand for expertise. So mm -hmm. who already has the, the skills or the know-how that can, mm -hmm. again, help me achieve my goals or overcome an obstacle? Mm -hmm. V stands for voices. So that is um, leveraging other people's endorsements or sponsorships. It could be reviews or testimonies or case studies. Mm -hmm. um, and understand that when you're going through this, not every category or everything is going to apply to your specific business um, goal or, or challenge, but it's laying all these out so that you can think about each one. Some may apply and some won't, but by the end, you're going to have a list of different ideas um, or ways to use leverage. Uh, mm -hmm. So I just wanted to kind of yeah. make that note there. Yep. Um, the nice. second E would be energy. So who has the personnel um, or the team that I can tap into that can help me get this done faster, right? So if my team or I don't have the time, you know, who can I potentially hire that can have it done quickly and maybe, you know, done right? The idea of like switching from how can I do it to who can help me get it exactly. done. Exactly, right. Um, then so R would be relationships. Mm -hmm. So, you know, who already has the relationships, the goodwill, the brand, the reputation, um, let's say with my target market that I can tap into, or maybe it's somebody I want to get to that, let's say is a partner. Mm -hmm. Um, it could be an email list. So already has a set of clients that would be ideal for your business. Mm -hmm. So that one's a key one. So relationships is, is big. An example um, of that for local businesses, at least, would be to go to the Chamber of Commerce and just tap into that, like build a relationship with the, the president, the, like the directors, and just kind of like bring value to the local community and, you know, find those relationships. Um, it's exactly. Really, it's yes. key to just shortcut. And like you said, work smarter, not harder, you know, instead of doing everything from scratch, tap into those shortcuts and, and find the relationships that you need. Um, I think, and then we have assets. Right. So assets um, could be anything from property. Uh, it could be building space. It could be land. It could mm -hmm. be capital. Um, you know, so again, just trying to think of, okay, and it really depends. It's hard to say uh, without knowing somebody's, you know, goals or, or what they're trying to accomplish. But, you know, again, that's kind of like the physical um, assets potentially, but it could be equity as well. Mm -hmm. And then G would be growth strategies. So, you know, for every business that wants to grow, um, that includes looking at other companies, let's say marketing campaigns um, or their advertising campaigns, what their client retention uh, system is like, you know, mm -hmm. what do they do to make sure that they keep clients coming back? Mm -hmm. um, could be as simple as again, follow up emails or text messages or, mm -hmm. or something like that, as we kind of talked about before. Mm -hmm. um, it could be their referral system. So how do they uh, incentivize or how do they promote referrals in their business? Mm -hmm. So we want to look into you know, all of those different things uh, for growth strategies. And then um, the last E would be, equipment. oh. Equipment. Equipment, yes, thank you. So yeah. equipment, so physical things. So you know, if you have certain processes that need done, um, you know, is there any machinery, is there electronics or, you know, any, anything like that, that can, um, you know, again, help you to achieve your goals or overcome a challenge. So again, you, you want to go through kind of each category and think about each of those, uh, subcategories, let's call them and, yep. uh, see how, you know, how can I apply this to whatever business that I had written out or what, you know, is this going to help me overcome the challenges that are preventing me from reaching those goals. Yep. And uh, so once you have all these ideas, then you kind of want to rank them and say, okay, you know, I have five different ideas here by going through this leverage framework. Mm -hmm. What is the one that's going to allow me to maybe do it the fastest, maybe for the, less, the least amount of cost or mm -hmm. the most efficient? 
So mm -hmm. it's really dependent on, you know, what your goals are and what constraints that you have personally, mm -hmm. but that's, you know, the, the overall framework to kind of go through step-by-step -step of knowing your business goals or targets, what you need to get there, what challenges, or obstacles you have, coming up with all the different ideas or ways to use leverage and then prioritizing, okay, this one, or maybe these top two things are the best ways of using leverage to help me reach my goals or overcome a challenge or an obstacle. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's basically the, the entire framework there. No, that, I love it. And that basically um, describes a growth plan for any type of business really is getting clear on what your goals are, identifying the challenges and how you can get there. And I love how this pretty much brings all the noise out into like one simple framework. And in the book, you have specific detailed questions that people can just go through, just kind of like filling out a form or filling out, you know, a uh, survey. And by yeah. the end, you get pretty much, you brain dump all these crazy ideas that you have, and then you can follow a system or a process to reorganize them. And then you reverse engineer that whole process into a step-by-step -step action plan. That's yep. why I love how you laid it out here because it's very easy to take complicated concepts or advanced topics and just bring them down into an easy to execute uh, action plan. So yeah. that is amazing. I love it. And so before we wrap up here, um, any uh, general advice or recommendations would you have for a small business owner, a local business owner? More specifically, I work um, a lot with cryotherapy businesses and wellness businesses. Um, if anything that you want to add before we wrap up, go ahead. Yeah, I think, um, you know, a, a couple key things, um, you know, for Salim and I, we, we work a lot with uh, marketing funnels. And so, you know, a website is something that many businesses have, but unfortunately, they're not really designed for conversions. And yeah. so, um, you know, what you want to do with your website is, you know, it's kind of counterintuitive, but you want to make it as simple as possible. You know, it, from my perspective, a website is it's a marketing asset. And it should really be used to help you grow your business um, and not really just act like an online brochure that's just there for people to check you out, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and with that said, your two main objectives with a website is to either generate revenue or sales mm -hmm. uh, directly or to generate leads. Mm -hmm. And so most people do not buy on the first interaction, right? Yeah. I usually don't. You probably don't. And, you know, most people don't. So it's important to not just make it easy for somebody to, you know, book an appointment with you or, or call. So make that very, um, you know, easy, have it at the header, um, but then have an offer for, as we mentioned, like an introductory offer for people who have never heard of you before, um, mm -hmm. but are looking to maybe try your services. So mm -hmm. make them an offer because offers are why people usually take action. Right? And mm -hmm. so the more offers you make, the, the easier it is to move people through your process. And try to strip out everything else that doesn't help you with those two objectives, right? So it's easy to have, you know, five different tabs or pages and all your social media links and all these things. And, you know, I think it hurts more than it helps because like I mentioned before, we're all distracted. So it it's gives people an easy never. way out. Yep. Yeah, it gives people way too many chances to leave your website, to go check out other things, and then just go down the rabbit hole of, you know, a social platform. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on your website, I would say, you know, make it very easy for people to call or book an appointment. Um, you know, if you have a USP on there, then, you know, make that known and then uh, just make, make an offer. And uh, ideally, you know, for somebody to get that offer, again, they can call, but if you want to, you can have them opt in because yep. once they're into your follow-up process, that's when you can really... Um, you know, leverage email marketing or even text messaging to get them to make, make sure that they book that first appointment, yeah. right? And not just say, oh, here's an offer. And then, you know, they might take it or they might, they might leave, but at least if they're in your system, yeah. you, know, you can follow up with them. Um, and again, that goes back to, it's not just what you market, but it's how you market it that really makes a difference. Yeah. Um, and then another tip, I guess, would be if you can, you know, you know, you probably already have a, a some sort of value ladder, right? You probably have multi um, packet or session packages and things like that, but just uh, make sure that you offer it at the right time. So when somebody just maybe had their first one, you know, present them and maybe tell them too, if you know that the majority of people take this package, right? Let them, let them know. Cause you're making it easier for somebody to make that decision. Oh, 
the majority of people take this session because you know this is where they see the best results mm -hmm. you know and some a client hears that it's like okay okay great that makes it easier i don't have to think about like do i need three five do i need ten set what's you know yeah. the majority of people do this one because and then you know share the benefits with the client yeah um and then the third thing would be again to really just make sure that your follow-up process is you know not just good in terms of frequency so i would say at least one email a week you know, shouldn't take you, you know, that long to craft, yep. but then also over the long term, right? We want to make sure that we have clients over the long term. Um, again, if it makes sense for your business, but don't just assume that people are going to naturally pull out their phone and schedule if they need something like monthly. And especially if it's something that they need more frequently to get the benefits, right? If it it's, should be front loaded, let's say, then you may, you want to make sure that you're taking that into consideration when you're creating your follow up. Uh, to make it as effective as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Those are fire tips. Um, and like I always say, a confused mind never buys. And yes. these days, most websites are designed pre-social media. They were designed before we were glued to our phones, before we were distracted by so many things out there. And so right now, if you have a generic website that's has so much information chances are it's hurting your business more than anything right so it is really important like you said to just trim down and have it so that they either take the action that you want them to take or they leave and that's yeah. fine because that's how you filter out those people and so those are amazing tips thank you so much dan for yeah, of course the show here and before we say goodbye how can people get the book the Marketing and Business Growth Playbook, The Essential Blueprint for Clarifying Your Message, Generating More Profits, and Growing Your Small Business. Um, where can they go and get it? Uh, yeah, so they can go to the mbgplaybook.com. Uh, okay. So the book is available on Amazon as Kindle, paperback, or as an audiobook. Um, okay. But if you go to the mbgplaybook.com, I do have supplemental resources that come with the book. Um, so it's a fillable PDF basically has all the questions that are laid out in the book, but in a digital format, um, as, as well as other templates and, uh, trainings that could be beneficial for helping you with, uh, growing your business. Awesome. I love it. We'll put a link down below and, um, yeah, this is, this is an amazing book guys, um, in the industry and I've learned so much from it. So don't hesitate, go and grab it. And Dan, thanks again so much for coming on the show. And um, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, share some thoughts and ideas. Hopefully it was valuable for your audience. Appreciate oh. it, Celine. Thanks for coming on, man. Bye-bye. Yeah, of course. Take care.